what, 12.30? I got home in at the 1 cold? Yes. 1 a.m., man. A lot of coffee, a lot of coffee. <laughs> you were one of those out there. More than a million people braving bone-chilling weather to ring in the new year here in the Big Apple. There's a big moment. Temperatures plummeting to just 10 degrees. The second coldest New Year celebration in Times Square on record. Yes, yes it was. But it was even colder in Chicago at just zero degrees for the countdown to midnight. In Dallas, thousands of people try to stay warm to watch the fireworks. And in downtown Los Angeles, there were no fireworks. Instead, people ringing in the new year with an incredible 3D video display on City Hall Tower. And That's it sounds so like cool. a DJ as well. Some more unique celebrations also taking place across the country. I like this one. This one's awesome for everybody except for the possum. Brasstown, <laughs> North Carolina is a scene. They celebrated with a possum drop. And then it, the party goers down in Key West, Florida, were celebrating by dropping a supersized red high heel. Why not? So that's some pretty uh, un unique celebrations across the country. I'm just glad, you know, I thought it was cold in New York City, uh, Chicago. Chicago. So those folks were really cold there. So at least, uh, you know, but whatever. It was well, cold all around, I guess. Tell us a little bit more about yesterday, because out of the three of us, you packed in enough New Year's Eve excitement for all of us, <laughs> while Peter Ducey and I were literally asleep at 7 o'clock. Uh, I mean, it, it was quite literally one of the most fun things I've ever done in my entire life. I mean, you've got the music going, you've got all these awesome bands. I had so much fun with Ed Henry and D. Kane. We basically laughed for two hours You were straight. dancing. Look at that. Yeah, so they, they uh, clearly horrible, horrible dancing. I'm not a good dancer. No. Um, but you know, whatever. We just had fun with it. It was amazing. It was such an honor to be a part of it. Uh, I'm so glad I got to be there, and I'm glad to be here with you guys this morning as well. Where does Superman, so much fun. Where does Superman land on the uh, rhythm scale? Um, you know, they had some moves, but it was funny because I made a joke to him because I'm sure you guys have seen in, in Times Square, there's a guy who walked around as, uh, dress, or walks around dressed as Batman. Right. <laughs> and so I was like, uh, Dean, you know, you've got some competition, you're Superman, I've seen Batman around, so, you know, where's the cape? But he, he didn't have it, so. <laughs> but then, no, I think okay. he's just not able to take uh, change into it unless there's a phone booth. And as you I know, it, phone booth. Times Square, very hard to find a phone booth. <laughs> well, especially with the 18. crowd, right? Right. Oh, yeah. well, you didn't know, Batman is actually Ed Henry. <laughs> uh, let's get to your resolutions. 47% of men likely to make a New Year's resolution in the year 2018. 53% of women likely to make one. 63% of those age 18 to 29 likely to make a New Year's resolution. And 68% of those who made resolutions in 2017, I'm going to add a word here, say they kept yeah. at least part of their <laughs> promise because we know you're lying. They told the pollster. So people have been emailing in what their resolutions are. Keep them coming. Uh, here's one from Bo. Bo. He wants to spend more time with his family and to help the less fortunate when he can. That's really good, good though. That makes me feel, um, you know, really inferior with my resolution. <laughs> All right, well, Teresa says, my resolution is to worry less and to live life in the moment, or to live in the moment. That's also a very good one. I might take, take some of these resolutions and use them as my own. And from Larry, my New Year's resolution is to try to get my fiance to set a date. Best Ooh. of luck in that endeavor, Larry. I All think right, Larry. now that it's been aired out for all of Fox News viewership yeah. to see. I think there's going to be some pressure. Come on, Larry's fiance. I hope you get that too, Larry. Yeah, come on, Larry's Let's fiance. Let's do it. Do it now. And did you guys see the video yet last night of President Trump at his really glitzy Mar-a-Lago wow. party? I was it covering this actually last year from oh, the really? causeway across uh, down there in Palm Beach along Southern Boulevard. But they did it again last night for the first time as president. There you see Baron Trump on the left in a tux with his dad, the president, and the first lady, Melania, and they told everybody listening this. Happy New Year. We're going to have a great year. It's going to be a fantastic 2018. We're off to a very good start, as you know, with the great tax cuts and ANWR and getting rid of the individual mandate, which was very, very unpopular, as you know. But we are going to have a tremendous year. The stock market, I think, is going to continue to go up. Companies are going to continue to come into the country, and uh, they're doing it now, soon to be a record clip. Yes, yeah, so he ended 2017 getting tax reform law 
tax reform done, something Republicans have been trying to get done for 30-something years, opening up drilling in Anwar, something proponents have been trying to do for uh, 40 years, and also repealing the individual mandate, something Republicans have been trying to do uh, for something like eight years. And so the big question for 2018 is, Todd, does he take this momentum into 2018, you know, what does he get done on infrastructure, tax right. reform? So, what are your thoughts? Well, look, we got a or lot not to tax get tax reform, to, uh, DACA. But, but DACA is DACA going to necessarily be tied to keeping the government open, infrastructure, like you mentioned? Don't forget about welfare reform because welfare reform definitely provides, I think, to the Republicans a way to pay for a lot of these things. But then you get into a situation: will Democrats seize on the moment and accuse Republicans of class warfare? So, a lot of issues, a lot of opportunity, and so with all that, as the Setting. President Trump tweeted this. He He's, did. Who's reading it? Uh, why don't you take yeah. it? Peter, why don't you? you take Todd it. just set it up so nicely for you. All here. right, let's knock look at the big out. wall downstairs. It says, as our country rapidly grows stronger and smarter, I want to wish all of my friends, supporters, enemies, haters, and even the very dishonest fake news media a happy and healthy new year. 2018 will be a great year for. America. Sounds so like nice, kind of. He put yeah, a nice like a, bow on right. 2017 with that, but some very, very serious things happening internationally that he's got to deal with today when he heads on back to the White House, including Iran, where these protests are bubbling up, and now the regime in Tehran has turned off social media as a way to stop people from communicating, stop people from figuring out how, where these protests are, and stop the rest of the world from seeing videos like the one that you're seeing right now. Well, and yeah, and we're on day four of these protests. President Trump has tweeted that the world is watching, trying to put some pressure uh, on the leaders there in Iran. We've had people killed in reports of, I think it was up to anywhere from uh, up to 80, 80 uh, people, I think, that mm -hmm. were arrested. Um, but we talked to uh, Professor Alan Dershowitz about this earlier. So listen to what he had to say. President Trump has indicated that he will not stand behind the Iranian regime. Look, the Iranian regime is failing. The people there are hungry despite the infusion of cash. They want a change. Iran is the most secular, democratically oriented group of people in the Middle East. They have been repressed now for so many years by the Ayatollahs. If they had their wishes, if they had a genuine election, they would overthrow this regime of religious thugs and substitute a real democracy. Well, Myanmar, um, Myanmar. Myanmar. <laughs> we're bringing I'm, I'm making, to this. We're making up words. We're making up words. It'll mean, always be Burma to me. Meanwhile, Mark Levin used uh, the Iranian protest to hammer NFL protest or players. I can't talk to you. I'm sorry, guys. You've had one he hour took of sleep. A knee it's okay. In the last game of the season, uh, he tweeted. Meanwhile, uh, I'm going to get this word right now. As people protest under threat of death or imprisonment for their basic liberties in Iran, millionaire football players continue making, I'm not going to say the word, That's of it. themselves uh, in the football field. So some pretty uh, harsh words there from Mark Levin. Uh, your thoughts, Peter? Uh, you know, these protests are supposedly economic. Remember, part of the Iran deal was if you guys say that you'll stop making nukes, we will give you $1.7 billion in cash. And that is, what the Obama, cash. that is what the Obama administration did. Uh, so now I think the question for a lot of these protesters is, what happened to all that dough? Yeah. Well, and I think, too, he's, he's kind of pointing out the, the fact that, you know, here are people who desperately want freedom, who are under an oppressed regime. And here in America, we have a democracy. We have freedom. We, we have the ability for NFL players to go out and make so much money off of something that they enjoy doing, off of a sport. And so I think what he's trying to say is, uh, you know, open your eyes and realize how lucky we are to live in the greatest country in the world when there are so many people that are living under right. oppression that don't get the freedoms that we are able to enjoy. And to your point, Lisa, I mean, think about the tweeting that all the players did over the course of the last 24 hours. Just It's a Sunday game day. Think of that freedom that they allowed, allowed them to tweet, Instagram, Facebook, and all that stuff during these protests over there in Iran, that was all shut down. And so mm -hmm. just from that one tiny small social media example, you get to see the microcosm that is freedom and how lucky we are to have it. And this is just a quick little aside. Sure. Uh, this is a little bit of a uh, little knife in there. Uh, <laughs> take right. a look at the players who protested and the percentage of those players who are going to the playoffs. It's not high. It's not high. All right. Just well, a little, yeah. little aside. The thing though, if this is really all about social media, you wonder, if the Ayatollah watched the current American president rise to power 
using social yeah. media, you wonder if that might be part of the thinking behind turning it off well, as others are possibly trying to see and, and it's going to be interesting to see um, you know if, if these protests continue it'd be interesting to see um, President Trump and how he handles this because President Obama got a lot of criticism in 2009 at the start of his presidency uh, for sort of turning an eye a blind eye I, I really can't talk that <laughs> turning a blind eye uh, to you know similar protests we saw in response to what many people deemed uh, and saw as a rigged election and they felt like he didn't do anything that he was silent uh, you know, so it's going to be interesting to see how President Trump and the, the Trump administration uh, handles this. But we've got Jillian Mealy, and you know a thing or two about football. We were talking about that earlier. Uh, so what's, what else is going on in the world? I also know on? a thing or two about uh, something that Janice Dean just tweeted a minute yeah. ago, saying it's the second, last night anyway, New Year's Eve was the second coldest New Year's Eve on record in New York City. You were sitting out there for hours. You got no sleep, so we appreciate well, you Janice doing Dean that. Well, Janice Dean is always right, but here she is very, very, very <laughs> <laughs> yeah. It was 9 degrees at midnight. Very so cold. There you have it. And we will get to more on the uh, temperatures and the weather across the country in just a second, guys. But let's begin with this. The suspect behind an ambush attack that left a deputy dead ranted about law enforcement online. Matthew Riel fired more than 100 rounds holed up in his bedroom before being shot dead by officers outside Denver, Colorado. Three deputies, one police officer and two civilians wounded in the attack as they responded to a noise complaint. We've got three officers hit, one down. All of them were shot um, very, very quickly. Um, and uh, they all went down uh, almost within seconds of each other. The fallen officer is identified as 29-year-old Zachary Parrish. The husband and father of two young daughters was on the force for seven months after serving two years as a police officer. His wife says he loved this job more than any job he ever had. Friends remember him as selfless and went to him for scriptural advice. Law enforcement lining the streets, saluting Parrish's body in a show of respect. President Trump offering his condolences online, tweeting, quote, we love our police and law enforcement. God bless them all. All of those wounded are expected to survive. Ten Americans are dead after a fiery plane crash in Costa Rica. A small charter plane crashing into the mountains and bursting into flames shortly after takeoff. Incredible video of the aftermath showing fire and broken jet parts. None of the 12 people on board survived, including a family of five from New York. There's also reports of two Florida doctors and their teenage daughter among the dead. That crash is under investigation. As promised, turning now to extreme weather and the bitter cold weather gripping the nation. Some places seeing snow and ice. Those dangerous conditions leading to a 40 car pile up in Michigan. Brand new video just released. Just keep, oh, there's a big truck pile in here. Whoa, 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 right in front of us, down in the ditch. Whoa, whoa, here's another one right in, whoa, another one going in. Wow, that is insane. The Deep South now feeling an Arctic cold front with possible snow and freezing rain. So look at your headlines, guys. That is crazy. When you see the video of the cars, just you got no control at that second. Great. Hope everyone stays safe. Mm -hmm. Jillian, thanks. thanks. Jillian. Uh, North Korea starting 2018 with a brand new threat to America. Kim Jong-un says his finger is on the nuclear button. So how should the U.S. respond? Former U.S. ambassador to the U.N. John Bolton is live to weigh in on that next. And a bold prediction from a top Democrat about Joe Biden in 2020. Hmm. hmm. We'll see. We'll see. President Trump responding briefly Sunday to a chilling warning from North Korean dictator Kim Jong-un now claiming to have a nuclear button ready on his desk. Here to react, former U.S. Ambassador to the U.N. and Fox News contributor John Bolton. Happy New Year to you, sir. And uh, I'm going to get the perfunctory question out of the way. Uh, one, is there a button? And two, does it matter if there is a button or is our diplomacy policy going to be the exact same? Well, look, it's uh, propaganda from Kim Jong-un. This is his regular New Year's speech. And uh, obviously, he has seen the conversation in the United States that looks at a possible preemptive military force, not, not as the most attractive option, but as an option that we definitely have to use uh, if they don't give up their nuclear weapons program. So we need a very careful calibration exactly what the North's capabilities are. I think they've made incredible advances in the past year. They're very close to crossing the finish line, but they haven't done it yet. And if he has a nuclear button on his desk, maybe he could give us a copy of it too. Ambassador Bolton, what do you make of Kim Jong-un's plans for 2018, though? Because on, uh, in the same breath that he is reaching out to the South Korean 
government and saying that he wants things to cool off enough for North Korea to be able to send athletes to the Winter Olympics in a few weeks, that it's 50 miles from the border. I, a second later that he says, but I also can nuke the U.S. anywhere, anytime. Well, you know, uh, some people, like the New York Times, took that part of his speech to be an opening, an indication maybe he wants to talk, which is, as the saying goes, roughly the equivalent of uh, the mafia and the police sitting down to discuss their common interest in law enforcement. Talks for North Korea are not about ending the nuclear weapons program. Talks are about getting something they want, participating in the Olympics, or, I think, more likely here, buying time to f cross that finish line perfect their targeting systems, uh, and be able at some point, perhaps in the next year, to be able to hit targets in the United States with thermonuclear weapons. That's why President Trump inherited this situation. He's got very little time left uh, to make a decision what to do right. or face a future where North Korea has nuclear weapons. From North Korea to Iran, uh, the president tweeted over the weekend as follows, Iran, the number one state sponsor of terror with numerous violations of human rights occurring on an hourly basis has now closed down the internet so that peaceful demonstrators cannot communicate not good. I, I want to ask you this question, Ambassador Bolton. Um, is there a way that we can use these protests to benefit our geopolitical stance in the world? Uh, absolutely. Uh, and I think it's important to understand these protests are very different from the post-election protest in 2009, where many people believe Mahmoud Ahmadinejad won re-election by fraud. The protests back then were over who was going to run the regime. These protests about whether the regime survives or not, and that makes them much more threatening to the Ayatollahs, much more dangerous, and raises the stakes uh, considerably. I think President Trump has already signaled a huge difference from the Obama administration by supporting the protesters, but I think we need to do more. We do not want to make the same mistake that America made uh, before in 1956, calling opposition out in Hungary and standing by watching while Soviet tanks crushed the opposition. After defeating Saddam Hussein in 1991, we called for that regime to be overthrown and stood by where Saddam massacred uh, other Iraqis. Right. So I think we do need to provide assistance. I think we can do it in several ways. Number one, this is yet another reason why the president should get out of the nuclear deal with Iran, should resume all of our uh, previous sanctions, putting increased economic pressure on the regime. We should provide material financial support to the opposition if they desire it. We should work with uh, intelligence services from other countries, okay. Saudi, Israel, to provide more pressure. There's a lot we can do and we should do it. Our goal should be regime change in Iran. Ambassador John Bolton, thank you very much. Happy Glad New Year. Happy thank you, sir. Year. All right, so coming up, violence on the southern border, the new way our agents are coming under attack. And the secrets of the Secret Service revealed. Up next, shocking stories from behind the scenes of the Clinton White House from a former agent who lived through it all when Fox and Friends returns on this first day of 2018. Your first news by the numbers of 2018, New Year's edition. First, 10 degrees. That's how cold Lisa Booth was during the countdown to 2018 in New York City. The second coldest New Year's Eve on record in Times Square. Next four, that's how many teams are competing in the college football playoff semifinals today. First up, number two, Oklahoma taking on number three, Georgia, in the granddaddy of them all, the Rose Bowl. Then, number four, Alabama will challenge number one, Clemson, in the Sugar Bowl. You know it's going to be an exciting Final Four when Alabama's the worst team. And finally, from 2018 back to 2017, an airline taking its passengers back to the future. I'm from the future. I came here in a time machine that you invented. Taking off from New Zealand at 12.05 a.m. on January 1st, 2018, landing in Honolulu at 10.16 a.m. on December 31st. How do you say that happens? Well, because Hawaii is 23 hours behind. <laughs> That's cool. How about that? Math. All right, so in the new book, Secrets of the Secret Service, author Gary Byrne details his time as a Secret Service agent and how the Clintons, he says, destroyed the agency's integrity. In the book, he writes, how can a security agency protect its protectees from themselves, especially when the protectees continually seek to systematically destroy the protocols that ensure protection? The agency had decided to err on the side of blind loyalty, and that was nearly its undoing. 
Well, so what does the future look like for the agency? Joining us now is former Secret Service agent uh, and author of Secrets of the Secret Service, uh, Gary Bryan. Um, you know, so Gary, you, you say that the Secret Service has failed. How has it failed? Good morning and, and Happy New Year's. And Happy New Year to you. Services, thank you. The Secret Service has failed in many ways. Let's start uh, back in history a little bit. Uh, by the time President John Kennedy was assassinated, four other presidents had been shot at in open cars, but they were still using open limousines. And then we, if you fast forward to modern day, President Obama was on a trip down to the CDC in Atlanta, and the Secret Service, the, you know, the individual men and women that are doing the job, the agents and officers are good people, but they're exhausted. And th they made some mistakes that day, and they let a man with a handgun get on an elevator three times with President Obama, and they didn't even know he was armed. They have completely failed. The only thing that kept President Obama alive that day was luck and that the guy didn't have malice and didn't want to murder him. Hmm. But we do want to be clear, and it kind of pings out something that you just said when you were talking about the Kennedy sure. case, uh, because I spend a fair amount of time at the White House and at presidential events. The sure. Secret Service agents and uniformed officers are very hardworking people, and they go through a rigorous background check and training to get to that level so you're not That's suggesting right. that there's any problem with the no. people who are on the front line you are suggesting that there is a problem with leadership and that they may have been manipulated by some of the politicians who Absolutely. they work with. Their, their, leadership, their leadership and management has completely failed. It stopped protecting the president a long time ago and protected the Secret Service. The individual men and women, as you know, I was a uniform division officer for 12 years at the White House. And uh, I know how hard they work. And here's an example of how bad they're managed. The average uniform division officer at the White House makes between seventy and $100,000 a year. In the last couple of years, because of their poor, the Secret Service's poor management, some of these men and women are making over $230,000 a year. One of them made more than the Secretary of Homeland Security. You cannot keep working your employees like this. It's not sustainable. They're crushing their employees. And they have the same problem with the agent division. Mr. Byrne, I want to get into a little bit more during the Clinton years. And here's an excerpt uh, from your book on China Gate, what's called China Gate. The Secret Service yes. knowingly allowed Chinese generals disguised in civilian clothing to meet administration personnel at the White House and log them as, quote, business guests at the administration's request so as to avoid transparency. Can you get into a little bit more about this incident and, if we have time, other incidents involving the Clintons? Absolutely. So it's not technically the Secret Service's job to tell the Clintons or any administration who to let in. But here's how it happened. We, I got a phone call early that morning from the Technical Services Division telling me that the, four gen the five gentlemen that were coming in that were from China were actually Chinese generals. And they came in in suits. Um, they came in to talk to the administration um, about something. And, um, and then later on, that turned into to, to another scandal part of that, um, where... Um, the Democratic Party was accused of doing certain illegal things uh, with cam campaign contributions. But the, the bottom line is, is these guys were, were generals in the Chinese army and they were brought in um, wearing suits and um, the Secret Service knew about it. Um, and then later on, it, it kind of blew up on them, on the Clintons. Hmm. I, I don't know if we have a lot of time here, but real quickly, do you think changes will be made with the Secret Service? Well, that's my biggest fear, and it's one of the reasons I wrote my book, Secrets of the Secret Service, because I don't believe there will be. There will be changes, because the Secret Service, the one thing that it's good at is hammering its employees and keeping this, this false narrative that they're the best at what they do, which is not a, a they want to be the best, and, and the rank and file uh, try to do the best, but their management system has completely collapsed. Now, they have a new director that right. was not former Secret Service, but um, he is, everybody underneath him is former Secret Service, and I'm not sure he knows exactly what's going on All right. and well, that's another reason th thank you uh, Gary, Gary Byrne author of secrets of the secret service thank you for your time today we really appreciate it and thank you for sharing your thank book you. with us thank you sir happy new year thank you happy thank new you. year all right well a bold prediction from a top Democrat about Joe Biden in 2020 and a billion people watched the ball drop in Times Square <laughs> last night but what about the peep drop the oddball New Year's traditions being celebrated around the country next. Plus, is your fridge full of leftover champagne? Well, <laughs> you have some creative... You like that, didn't you? Yeah, I did. Uh, the creative ways you can put it to good use this morning. Wait, it does, does the Times Square ball look different to you? It's uh, a little yellower. <laughs>
That's not the crystal ball in New York City's Times Square. This is your shot of the morning from Bethlehem, PA. A 400-pound marshmallow peep helped ring in the new year there. I actually, I would eat this, but then I'd get very, very, very sick. All right. In the city of Atlanta, lowering down a 800-pound peach. That's a big peach. And a music note dropping in Nashville, Tennessee, to mark the arrival of 2018. There it is. Mm -hmm. I, I just want to say, speaking of Nashville, during your show, yeah. how awesome did Griff Jenkins look in that hat? If also, we can get that picture up, that should be our shot of the morning at 8 o'clock. I don't know if he would get mad at me or not, but um, I can't remember when during the 8 to 10 p.m. hours uh, this happened, but he was dancing and he did a kick. Of course. It was amazing. Well, you're, you know, I hope we, we with have the Rockettes, it. it's kind of, this is the season, but once the first gets around. That's how Griff well, goes. And I have to retire for a couple months. Uh, so your New Year's pictures are pouring in as well. We got this one from Cheryl, who writes, spent New Year's Eve with the Royals. <laughs> so, as she partied with her two daughters Beautiful. in their crowns. They're so cute. And this is Jeff celebrating on a cruise from Cape Horn to the uh, Falcon Islands in South America. So well done. A lot of people there. And check out Linda. She's ringing in the new year with her family in PJs. Just the way Peter Ducey and I were <laughs> ourselves. Send us your New Year's Eve photos. We will be showing them to you all morning long. And with that, you know, she always touts herself as, I'm the most boring person in the world. But what did you do for <laughs> New Year's Eve, Jillian? I was asleep around 7.30. There we go. <laughs> <laughs> Proving my point. I'm the point. most boring person in the world. I don't think you're boring. And I'm fine with it. Good morning, guys. <laughs> Thank you, Lisa. Good morning to you at home. Happy New Year. Let's begin with this headline. A U.S. Border Patrol agent rushed to the hospital after being attacked with a grapefruit-sized rock. The agent breaking his ribs when his ATV flipped crushing him underneath that rock thrown from the Mexican side of the border near San Diego. According to Border Patrol, agents in that region were assaulted 83 times last year. It happened 52 times in 2016. There have been more than 100 reported assaults nationwide since October. Do the Democrats think they have a candidate to run against President Trump in 2020? The ex-DNC chair thinks so. There's only one person I can say would definitely win the election. And is a superstar who could have appeal in almost every state in the union. And that's Vice President Biden. Well, you heard it. Ed Rendell telling New York's AM 970 host that if Biden runs, he would win overwhelmingly. Biden has become a frequent critic of Trump since his inauguration, and many speculate he has his eye on a presidential run. Stay tuned. Maria Menounos ringing in the new year with a wedding right in the middle of Times Square. Do you freely and without reservation give yourself to Maria in marriage? I absolutely do. <laughs> And Maria, do you freely and without reservation give yourself to Kevin in marriage? I do. Menounos marrying longtime boyfriend Kevin Undergaro on live TV. Her Fox New Year's Eve special co-host Steve Harvey officiating the ceremony. The couple has been together for 20 years, so many congrats. Let's look at your headlines, guys. I'll send it to you. I, an interesting choice to have the yeah. host of Family Feud <laughs> yes. officiate a <laughs> wedding. Peter also got married on TV last night. <laughs> What's ironic saying. about that is he actually called her Natalie Morales. Which is unfortunate <laughs> because that's what Steve Harvey does. He misses names. Aww. Three people got Darn. that joke. All right. Uh, I have a leftover bottle it. of bubbly in the fridge from last night. Well, have no fear. Lifestyle expert and chef Ashton Keefe joins us with some fun recipes that you can whip up with your extra champagne and sparkling wine. Ashton, this is a lot more imaginative than most people who just pour the champagne in with some orange juice. Of course. Well, that's fine, too. But we have two recipes and two cocktails for you yeah. if you have any leftover, which you might not, but that just gives you an excuse to open an, an, another bottle. Um, okay, so we're making mimosa pancakes. So okay. this is a play on a mimosa, but we're doing it in pancakes. So what I have here is just salt, whoop, baking powder. We've got here, I'm going to employ you guys to help me. I've got some milk. I've got some orange juice and orange zest, eggs, sugar, and then... A lot of stuff that you would have in the kitchen. A lot of stuff anyway. that you would have in kitchen. And then we're using Enza Prosecco. So this is like Perfect. a $15 bottle. And then I just like 
Just make it nice and bubbly. And this is going to give your pancakes lots of lift. Um, it's really delicate in flavor, a little bit of citrus notes. And then I'm pairing the pancakes with a bunch of just like Supreme citrus. So this won't get you drunk. And it won't get you drunk. It's just it's just to have fun. And then right you the guys chance. will see how beautiful they are. And that's your mimosa pancake. And you can have them with mimosa. You know, so, so maybe, you know, you entertain on New Year's Eve. You want to keep it going. You want to entertain on New Year's Day. So yes. tell us, you know, some charcuterie you've got over here. Uh, tell us a little bit about what we have over here. So this is a bubbly fondue because who doesn't love, who doesn't cheese, love cheese and wine? And so instead of using Don't white know. wine, we're using yellowtail bubbles. So this is a $10 bottle. It's really lovely. It's delicate, but you can cook with it too. So what I did here is I just took some shallots and a little bit of that leftover bubbly and I reduced it and I'm using three parts of different cheeses. So can about we put a, the cheese in? Please. So we got about half <laughs> a pound. Of all of it. Wow. Well, it's, it's fondue. So we've got sharp cheddar, gruyere, and brie. But you can use whatever you have on hand. It's like there's no rules for fondue. Some of it is shredded some of it is cubed that's all going in the same thing? all going in it and just gonna melt and get nice and delicious and then I have a fondue sure, pot there you, know, you don't want I want it to give you the oh, opportunity. Okay. Oh, well. you so it, the best thing about this bottle uh, oh, this bottle of cheese. bubbles is you can actually reseal the top too so you won't lose any of the effervescence and then you just serve it with some crudite and you can like dip it in there and it's a nice fun party mm. in the morning or in the day or whenever you're having a house party on New Year's Day um, all right. Well, so sparkling sangria, you know, breakfast martini. What what is this, and how do you make it? Okay. So we have two cocktails here that are really really fun. We've got so kind of like I know the holidays are over, but we've got a nice cocktail and a naughty cocktail, and our Ooh. nice cocktail. I know, right? Which one would you choose? It's way God. too much excitement for the one. <laughs> like I'm an eight year old. <laughs> so so the nice cocktails for those who are doing a New Year's resolution. We have Epa sangria. It's a red sangria that's already made, so it's got lots of antioxidants, acai, blood of orange, and then I take is that. that nice or naughty? That's the nice one. Okay. That's a nice one. And I'm putting it in this big picture. So if you guys would actually do the honors, we're going to pour about half of that sangria in here, this red bottle right here, and then about right. half of that bottle of the Enza Prosecco. So we're using the same thing that we use okay. in our mimosas, so you don't have to buy another bottle. You can do it together. Yeah, just do it together. Wow. So that's, that's, our, so that's our nice that's cocktail. Like yeah. That's our nice cocktail. Normal. So don't use all don't that use Prosecco, all because now we're going to make the breakfast martini, which is okay. like my naughty one. <laughs> all right, all right. So in wondering. the shaker, oh. Okay, we can do that. That's no, awesome. We're just going to go for it. We're, just gonna go we're, for we're, it. we're supposed to use that, though. Well, yes. yeah, yeah, we're and then we're going to do orange now. juice. You can pour orange juice. We've got some vodka. You can use gin, too. And then a little bit of um, orange liqueur. And we're just going to give that a very light shake. Oh, I want to do that. That's the reason I was on this. That's, I, I, it yeah. could be there for a reason. Um, and then and I batched it because that just makes life easier when you're having people over. Perfect. And then you just pour it into chilled martini glasses. So you subscribe to the oh, hair of the dog. You subscribe to the hair of the dog. Keep it going. Bring it into the nearest and the hair of the dog. Nearest okay. day. Okay. <laughs> right. That's shaken enough, I That's think. That's shaken. Where, where can I pour it in? Well, okay, so I batched it for us to make life she easy. It. So You're you always batching at home. things, Ashton. Yes, it makes things very, very easy. And then you can just top it um, when your guests come over and serve it. And this, all this stuff can sit out at um, room temperature and have for like a great New Year's Day party. Perfect. So, you know, let's say New Year's Day, you want to make some of these things. How long do you think it'll take folks at home to, to make them? Oh, 15 minutes, 15 minutes, 15 minutes. Oh, it's all that's very, very right easy. up my alley. Yes, yes, and you can <laughs> have easy. a glass of bubbles while you do it. I, I like the way you think. Yes. So yes, Ashton. maybe after the show. Okay. <laughs> Ashton Keith, thank you very much. Thank, thank you. you. A very happy New Year now. And right. I smell awesome. like booze for the next two hours and 20 you minutes. Do. Awesome. You, 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 all right, you do. No Tom Cruise. So, so, so do a lot of Americans. <laughs> all right. So coming up, actress Deborah Messing brought to tears of joy over this. That is her son sitting down during the national anthem. So is that really something to be proud of? Our next guest, an active duty U.S. Army officer, has his take. Hmm. And California has officially gone to pot. So who can smoke it and where? Will and Gray star Deborah Messing making headlines again after praising her son for sitting during the national anthem at a hockey game. The actress posting this photo with the caption, who's crying? I'm not crying. Hashtag Black Lives Matter. So what is the left getting so wrong about patriotism? Here to react, active duty U.S. Army officer, writer, and commentator, Jeremy Hunt. Jeremy, so great to see you here in the new year. Happy New Year to you. And uh, what Happy was your new reaction year. when you saw this? Yeah. Well, really, I, I thought about uh, my own family, and I, I really thought about how can patriotic Americans uh, best respond to these kind of acts of disrespect to the national anthem and to the flag. And I, I really think that for many of us, we should really be teaching the next generation uh, and teaching others 
to basically honor and cherish this country. I think that is the best response we can have, is that we can't control what other folks do or how they raise their children, but what we can do uh, is commit ourselves to, uh, to teaching others a better way. And so I'm so thankful to have grown up in a family that taught me to love this country, and uh, ultimately that's what, what led me to serve uh, in the greatest army in the world. Uh, and so that's something that I cherish, and so when I do have kids someday, I intend to teach them as well. You know, and Jeremy, well, first of all, thank you for your service, sir. Mm -hmm. um, you know, and secondly, a lot of Americans, including a lot of the viewers at home right now, they view this kneeling as an affront to patriotism, as a affront to our country, uh, or, or anti-American. And so my question to you, you know, you talk about future generations. How does this impact them? And how does this impact our country? I think what, how it impacts our country is that we have to be on the uh, on the offense and make sure that we are teaching folks uh, the better way, and we are very intentional about why we t about the way we talk about patriotism. And I think that we just can't take it for granted anymore. We have to be able to uh, instill these values uh, in the next generation uh, and be very uh, uh, intentional about how the way we do it. Jeremy, I want to go to the op-ed that you wrote now. It's a new op-ed, and it involves Disney World's Trump robot being the target of a screaming rant. Uh, and the question that we're asking this morning is, is there really any safe space left from the leftist insanity? Uh, listen to this soundbite first, and then we'll get your reaction on it. Hmm. Donald John Lock Trump. him up! Lock him up! Lock him up! Lock him up! Lock him and up. in response, the heckler that you hear saying lock him up at the Hall of Presidents there uh, writes, anyone that's upset I disrupted a family vacation can check their privilege and consider getting mad about the thousands of children being taken away from their parents because of Trump's racist immigration policies or the families uh, of the hundreds of trans Americans murdered each year by transphobic and homophobic people or the negative impacts of the tax bill on poor and middle income Americans. A lot to unpack there. What say you? <laughs> well, first off, I, uh, I wrote the piece to really point just at the absurdity uh, at someone that would heckle at, a, at what is essentially a children's event at Disney World. I mean, I think that protest politics has somehow reached a new low. I didn't think it was possible, but uh, I think we've definitely reached a new low in terms of how people protest in this country uh, to go to a place like Disney World. Uh, but really, uh, and, and more importantly, uh, his point about privilege, I, I noticed that a lot of folks uh, tend to use this kind of talking point about, uh, well, check your privilege basically as an escape from having to address any kind of criticism about their positions on issues and then and they kind of just dismiss any